Um, so it's pretty clear that we're folk mind body dualists. So we think of ourselves as being split between minds and bodies. Um, we structure our universities this way, so the Geisteswissenschaften versus Naturwissenschaften is built on mind-body dualism, right? Geist is just spirit, mind. Um, two different modes of understanding, two different ways of looking at the world. Um, and I think this mind-body dualism is one of the main barriers that uh, needs to get moved, we need to move past if we're going to understand what a physicalist or neuroessentialist uh, picture of the mind would look like. Um, you see this popping up, dualism popping up everywhere. It's why people get so excited about fMRI scans. Um, you do something, we've shown that if you do something, it changes your brain, and people are amazed. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it picking your nose changes your brain. I'm changing all of your brains right now, right? You couldn't experience anything if your brain wasn't changing. But we do think this is an amazing thing, and people will market their educational devices as something that changes your brain. Um, it also leads to uh, claims like this uh, piece, the Adam Gopnik piece you sent us. You know, he says at one point, ourselves shape our brains at least as much of our, as our brains shape ourselves. Um, to my mind, that's a nonsensical statement, um, really just assuming mind-body dualism, but it doesn't seem that's the consensus position in this room, so we should talk about that more. Um, but So what, what do we need to, where, where does this come from, and, and what would we need to at least examine more critically to try to work our way pe conceptually past mind-body dualism. The biggest issue is this cogito intuition. So this idea that um, we, the one, only thing we know for sure in the world is that we're conscious. And we have this kind of immediate access to our consciousness in a way we don't have access to anything else. And I think the two main pillars of the, the cogito intuition are the accessibility of consciousness. We know our consciousness in a way we don't know about the world. And this strong sense, I do think this is very much a part of the, the Descartes' intuition and even I'd say Jonathan's intuition, is there's a unitariness. Because even when you're, if you're looking at your little brain worm, um, there's still a kind of, there's you, you are that spotlight that's moving around and looking at stuff. You still have this kind of intuition that you know who you are and you are a unitary thing. Um, and I think both of these pillars are fragile. They're both problematic. So this idea that we are, we are accessible to ourselves and we have incorrigible knowledge of our subjective experience is just demonstrably false. Um, we often don't know why we're doing what we're doing. We, a lot of what we're doing is unconsciously motive, 90, you know, a huge amount of what we're doing, what I'm doing right now is unconscious to myself. Large amount of my motivations are not accessible to myself. When I try to make them accessible, when I introspect, I then often confabulate, and there's been very elegant experiments since the 70s showing how we, that Jonathan's been involved in some of these, showing how we confabulate when we try to uh, uh, explain why we did what we did. Um, it's also the fact that we're just, we are not unitary, we're fragmented. So uh, we're made up of many different parts. We understand a little bit about how this works from a neuroscientific perspective. Um, but I think the, uh, it's hard to maintain the cogito intuition when you look at things like selective deficits, so the fact that uh, a damaged part of your brain can selectively knock out your ability to use verbs or to see faces. Um, that really, uh, I think, fatally undermines this idea that consciousness is this kind of unitary thing that's a separate kind of stuff. Um, another big argument in my mind against the cogito intuition is, is dementia. When you see people, uh, people's minds falling apart piece by piece and there's never a point at which you can say, well, now they don't have a mind anymore. Now they're not conscious anymore. That also undermines the sense that we have a mind that's a unitary thing. So I think there's, there's a lot of reasons to doubt that there's any kind of unitary controlling um, sentience uh, running things, whether a little homunculus or a soul inside of us. We also have this design illusion. So we have this sense that um, there's a special type of causation, mental causation, that can give rise to design. So we have um, intention, and intention is somehow fundamentally different from the kind of mechanical causation that goes on in the physical world. So Reverend Paley coming across the pocket watch on the Heath sees that God exists because um, only God could design something like this. Only a mind could design this. But we now actually have pretty good models um, the neo-Darwinian model of evolution that explain how design can arise through blind processes. So we've got uh, 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 the blind watchmaker, Dawkins' blind, blind watchmaker, explaining how something that looks like it requires a mind doesn't actually require a mind. Um, we also have what Pat Churchwin calls this boggled skeptic argument. 
And so again, like the cogito arguments, I don't think it's really an argument so much as a feeling, which is, and it's, it goes back to Locke, this idea that there's no way in which, as he put it, dumb incogitate matter could ever give rise to mind. It just seems impossible to us. It, it, how any amount of matter thrown together could come up with something that's a mind. Um, and I think the answer to the boggled skeptic is already at hand. We have things that we know are just matter because we built them that are producing things that look a lot like mind. Um, so we have computers that can win at chess. We have now Watson that can beat human beings at Jeopardy. You know, at some point, um, well, we'll talk about this. So I think your argument would be at a certain point Watson gets consciousness somehow. Um, but if Watson tells us Watson's experiencing red, is that the case, even though we know it's built out of silicon and, and we made it? Um, there are also a series of what I call these annoying non sequitur arguments against physicalism, um, three and sap for short. Um, and these come out of the Adam, I read that Adam Gopnik piece, so I just want to run through these very quickly. Um, cognition is distributed. Um, you can be a physicalist and still, still think cognition is distributed. So it's, um, it's happening, it's not just our brains, it's our brain body systems embedded in this world that involves the social world and the physical world. We're using tools in our environment to think all the time, but that doesn't mean we're disembodied spirits. It just means we're extended in the physical world in certain ways. Um, a lot of people will also point to neuroplasticity. Oh, we're, we can change, so uh, it's not determined, and so therefore we're free. Or they'll turn to quantum mechanics and say, well, um, we don't live in a deterministic world because of quantum indeterminacy, therefore there's free will. Um, and it's very important, Dan Dennett's pointed out, that uh, randomness is not free will. They're very importantly different things. So we're not going to get free will out of quantum, uh, quantum mechanics. There's also this kind of common idea that physicalism leads to this very dehumanized view of the world. Um, we're going to turn into robots. So if I think the reason that I love my daughter is because of Hamilton's rule, she shares 50% uh, of my genes, that that means that that's really how, at the proximate level, I'm going to view this. And I think this, this ignores the extent to which ultimate versus proximate uh, causation need to be kept separate. Um, so Hamilton's rule produces a cognitive, uh, proximate psychology that makes me love my daughter that produces genuine love. Um, so there's, there's no way in which a physicalist view of the world is necessarily corrosive to human level truths because we're capable of keeping the two things separate, as many people have noticed. We can keep these two different things in our mind at the same time. Um, so I'll just say our, our uh, body-brain systems, uh, there are a lot of barriers, innate barriers to comprehending the ways in which we are body-brain systems. Um, but this is the same for all scientific insights. Many of the most important scientific insights are counterintuitive, um, but we learn eventually to embrace them, the fact that the Earth moves around the sun, and not the other way around, because they give us a better understanding of ourselves and our world. And I think this may also happen with our understanding of the mind. Thanks.